going live, so any minute now. Excellent. So, I mean, we might be live right now. For all oh. Know. So, <laughs> we now with Lydia, Lydia Lukidis. And uh, we have so many things to talk about. We have known each other uh, over uh, Facebook for years. Uh, I'm a fan of yours. But uh, we never have a chance to, to talk face to face. Well, yeah, it's a funny thing about the, the Kidlet community. We feel like we know each other quite well. And, and we do because we talk a lot and we're in different groups on Facebook. And there's a lot of conversations going on there. So you get to know people even though you haven't physically met. Yeah. So uh, before we start, uh, we have to do the jingle. Oh, okay. Because it cost me a fortune. to. <laughs> have to do the jingle, you know? We got to make use of that jingle. Yeah, what's the show without the jingle, right? Right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, and the jingle is... Get a chair, grab a seat, or we'll sweep you off your feet. We move, we groove, you got mail. Use your legs, rest a while, all you gotta do is smile. We're swell, can't you tell you got mail? When the show begins, you better hold on real tight. Or before you know it, you'll be high as a kite. Take a break, settle down. We're the only show in town. SRO, don't you know you got mail? Give it up, don't think twice. For a hurricane on ice. What the hell? Give a yell, ring your bell, show and tell. Mademoiselle, give a smell, you got mail. You've got Mel. And Mel has Lydia Lukidis. Wow, that's quite the jingle there, Mel. <laughs> It's not a bad jingle. Um, so um, tell us everything. Start at the beginning. Uh, you you have a Greek name. Yes. Uh, you live in Montreal. What are you? Greek, French, Canadian, Jewish? Tell us. I, I am. That's a great question. I'm Greek Canadian. So I was born here in Montreal. Uh, my parents are immigrants. Uh, they were actually not born in Greece. They're of Greek origin, but they were born in Istanbul. So that was, uh, you know, I mean, if you know anything about the history of the Greeks and the Turks, they, they didn't have the best history. So my parents always felt displaced because here they were growing up in Istanbul. Of course, they spoke Turkish, but with a heavy dialect. So people knew that they were Greek and they had Greek names. So they were never accepted by that community. And then when they went to Greece, they had, of course, a different dialect and they were not accepted because they were born in Turkey. So they didn't really feel like they belonged anywhere. And uh, at that point, my parents had just gotten married. They wanted to give their children a better life. So they decided, you know what? We heard a lot of great things about Canada. Let's go to Canada. So off they came and they literally didn't know anything about the different cities or where they would, they didn't have jobs. They were coming with an education, but without jobs. My father didn't speak any French at all. So my mother would actually attend the uh, interviews with him and would translate. Isn't that amazing? So they were literally on the bus saying, you know what, we don't know where we're going. We're gonna get off at the first big city. And that first big city was Quebec. Got off the bus, went to a couple of job interviews, didn't quite work out. Quebec City? Yeah, Quebec City. So that's in Northern Quebec, six hours about from Montreal. And it didn't quite work out. So on they were on the bus again. And then it was Montreal next. And then they got a job. Well, my father got a job first. He's actually a food chemist. So he had quite a, a really uh, you know, elaborate education and is very, very specialized in his field. So he, he, had, he had the credentials, it's just he didn't speak the language, but he got accepted. Uh, and then my mother started working as well. And then they started building a life. And then my brother came into the world. And then four years later, I came into the world. And here I am. <laughs> That's uh, incroyable. Yeah, it is. It's Again, uh, incredible in Quebec speak. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Now, I, I live in Quebec, so really it's, it's a French province primarily. Of course, there are Anglophones, but that's not the predominant language. So for me, I speak French as well. And my parents were very, you know, it was very important to them for their children, A, to get a really good education. Uh, B, to get a well-rounded education and to, you know, not only speak Greek and English, but to also speak French. So I'm fluent in French. And really, if you want to get a job here, you need to speak French and on a social aspect as well. I have a lot of French friends. So you have to, you know, be part of both cultures. And I kind of like that. It's, you know, English, French and everything in between. Montreal is a very diverse city. You have everything from Armenians to Greeks to Germans to literally anything. 
And so it's kind of a melting pot for different uh, communities. Absolutely. There used to be a big uh, Jewish uh, population in Montreal. Oh, there is. There still is. Believe me, it's nothing compared to what it was once. Oh, when I'm I, sure. When I was a kid in Ottawa. Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, it's still there, but I mean, I guess with with the year as years go by, things shift around uh, in terms of the communities. But there's still a pretty strong community here, and I actually went to private high school, and it was predominantly Jewish. Really? So I kind of grew up with uh, with that as well. Amazing. So Lydia, tell us um, about your childhood. I have a childhood theory for people who write children's uh, books. Let's see if you fit the theory or not. Oh, wow. I didn't know we were going to go this far back. <laughs> I love it. Usually we go 300 years back. But I <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I don't know if I have information on that. <laughs> well, you know, I had a really great childhood. I, I did see the world through the lens of wonder. And in many ways, I'm still like that. And it may be a great quality. It may also be a quality that has hurt me in the past. I am a little bit, you know, naive and I tend to see things with, you know, with a with a great optimism. And that's a great thing sometimes. And, you know, it it, it can go both ways. But uh, I, I was just curious about the world. I'm one of those people who's never bored. How could you be bored? Look outside. There, there's so much going on, so much to learn about, so much to do. In fact, I, I just find like there's not enough hours in the day. So growing up, I mean, I, I was always sensitive and I still am today, but always creative. So that the driving force in my life has always been creativity. In whatever vehicle that was, whatever medium that was, I must create. And I knew that at a very young age, I, I must create to be happy. And okay, that when, has when, been, when, yes, when, sorry. When did you start writing? What prompted well, you to become a writer? Your dad's I was, a You know, what's funny, I, I was just always writing. Did I think that that could be a career? No, I never once considered, hey, I could be a writer and make a living off this. It never entered my mind. I know that sounds silly, but I was writing since the age of six. I was mostly writing poetry and short stories. And, uh, you know, into my teenage years, it was very dark. I, I wore all black and hung out with the poets in university, and <laughs> wrote really deep poetry. That was totally my style. Uh, and that has been always my savior, honestly, it has been a form of therapy. I used to write journals and I would process my emotions in those journals and not, not to become a better writer, but just to express myself. Uh, and then the poetry and, you know, it, I just never considered being a writer, even though that was my first love. Okay, you talked about therapy and poetry, which is uh, all about angst. My wife is a poet. Yeah, yeah, a lot oh, yeah. of angst there. So excuse me for asking, but where was your angst? What was your, what was your conflict as a young person? Uh, well, I, I always felt different. And I realized we're all unique, different people. It's not there, that there's a norm, but I never quite fit in. And it started in preschool where I, you know, I got picked on a little bit for being different or, or having a different view. Or I was, I was incredibly shy as well when I was younger. Not so much now. I've kind of broken through that. You're fine. But I was very... I was very shy and, you know, I, I remember people calling me weird. This is a memory that I still have today. You're weird, but you know, you're a really good artist. So that was always the saving grace. They knew that I was talented. Well, they thought I was talented, but I was always weird. And that to a young person who's trying to fit in and trying to make friends, it's not necessarily the best thing. So that, and that carried into my, my teenage years as well. I, I, I didn't, fit into the, the cool group and so on and so forth. But, but in high school, I found my real friends that I'm still friends with today. So that has been a wonderful experience. And uh, then you went to university? Yes, I, you know what? I, I should also mention that I come from a family of scientists. So I was always encouraged to study science. Right. Uh, my brother's an engineer. What What's that? Me, your mommy. Well, my, my father's a food chemist. My mother, had she had the choice, because in Greece in those days, women could not study what they wanted if what they wanted to study was something considered to be a man's world, which was mathematics. My mother's a, a math whiz, like the smartest math whiz I know. She was not allowed to study that, unfortunately. So she studied education instead, became a teacher, which was a great career in itself. But she never got to, to study what she really wanted to. So I, I feel for that. And I feel for women who never had those opportunities. 
And my brother's an engineer. So it was science, science, science. And so I studied science. I followed with that. And you know what? I was really good at it. And I, I liked it. Uh, but when it came time for university, I, I got a degree in CGEP in pure and applied science. I was really good at it. And then in university, I said, oh, okay, you know what? I, I don't want to study science anymore. I don't know if this is for me. And I know for sure that I don't want a career in science. And so that was, you know, a big revelation for my family. And I, I had moved out at that point as well. And I think I dyed my hair red and got a nose ring. So I was kind of going through a transition, trying, but just trying to find myself. Who is Lydia? And what does Lydia really want? And so I ended up studying English literature. And I didn't know what I would do with it. And I was deathly afraid of well, what, what job am I going to get? How am I going to survive on English literature? Am I going to just become a professor? And is that what I want? I had no idea. I just said, Lydia, study what you love and the rest will come. And so that's what I did. Oh. So you, you loved, you, you gravitated to something you loved. Exactly. And where you studied at McGill? I studied at McGill, that's right. Great Which school. Which is a really good, good university. Oh, it's a great university. I still remember all my classes. I, I, I did minor in philosophy as well. So I'm a very philosophical person, very deep. Uh, so studying that was just like a dream come true and studying all the great Canadian poets. And I actually, I just have to say something. I went to school with Margaret Atwood's daughter. So <laughs> I got to meet Margaret daughter? Atwood's daughter. Yeah, wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like Montreal and McGill, you talk about poets. Oh, yeah. I mean, Leonard Cohen, uh, you know, Leonard Irving Cohen, Layton, all the greats, really. Abraham Klein and... Um, and, and Leonard Cohen's mentor, it escapes me for a second. Uh, oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. It'll, uh, it, it'll come to us. It's uh, a, 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 definitely a country rich with poetry. And I, I did study Canadian poetry specifically, which was so much fun. It's just I, I was in my element. I loved poetry. I loved writing. And here I was studying what I loved. Honestly, I loved my university years. It was great times. And uh, and then uh, when did you when did the coin drop? Lydia Lucidis can be a professional writer. Well, this is going to blow your mind a little bit. A lot of people in the writing community don't know this about me, but after I graduated, I, I went into a completely different profession. I became a jewelry designer. So I was a goldsmith for for ten years. I was a goldsmith. I am really, like I said, I'm an artist, and so at that time, expressing myself through design was the way it was. And I uh, made jewelry and high end, you know, gold, diamonds and all that kind of thing. And also fashion jewelry, I would do crazy fashion shows and I was expressing myself that way. Uh, so that lasted 10 years. Amazing. And then what happened? I know, it's- uh, <laughs> you're, keeping, you're keeping everybody in suspense. I know, now. I know, I'm keeping you guys all waiting. Well, you know, as I was telling you before this call began, uh, my career has not been linear at all. And it is what it is. It's not like I just wanted to study one thing and that's all I ever did. That's not been my experience. I've always loved writing, but I did kind of a circle into different mediums as well, which I'm really happy about now because it has made me a richer person. Uh, but uh, I, I did fall in love at one point and I got married and I got married to a puppeteer. And uh, at that time, he really wanted to work with me because I had a lot of skills like my carving skills. I would carve and wax for my jewelry projects and that would lend itself well to making puppets. So then I left the world and the world of fashion was kind of boring me after a while. I, I felt like I, I got what I needed to get out of that experience and that I didn't want to work in fashion anymore. It was, it was not who I really was. Uh, so then I moved on and I became a puppeteer and I, I literally toured the world. Like I remember going to China with my nine month old baby, you know, breastfeeding her in one hand and then doing puppet shows <laughs> you know, on the side. It was, such you a wonderful have, experience. You still have any of the puppets? Oh uh, yeah, we still have some of the puppets and it was uh, a really, really great experience. And I, I'm glad that I did that. What I learned through that though, is that I am a creator and not a performer. Even though I have a lot of great qualities to be a performer, it's not where I thrived. I didn't, I didn't like it. So I realized you have, you that- have, You have great hair. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank my mom for that. <laughs> If I stop poly, my mind. Oh, good one, good one. Um, so 
you know, I realized, you know, this is not quite for me. And then, and then I, I got divorced. And so in one foul swoop, I, I kind of lost a lot of things in my life and I had to start from zero because I lost my career. So I was careerless and, you know, uh, on my own. And that has been an experience, honestly, that I look back that has really fortified me. And it has been a blessing. At the time, I didn't see it as a blessing. It was a, a couple of years of tremendous darkness. Uh, anyone who's divorced with children will know how difficult it is to navigate through that path. Uh, but it was a really great gift because I had to, and, and it became this world of opportunity. Well, Lydia, you're not a puppeteer, you're not a jeweler, so what are you? The world is your oyster in a sense. You could do anything you like. Here's a wonderful world of opportunities. What do you choose? And through working in puppetry, I realized, you know what? I love working with children. I absolutely love it. We would go into schools and give workshops and I was really good at that. And I liked connecting to children. So I said, well, okay, I know I wanna work with children. So what does that mean? Do I wanna be a teacher? I was considering that for a while. And then it came back to writing. I said, well, wait a minute, I like to write. And before my writing was for adults. It was adult poetry, adult short stories. That's all I ever wrote. Then I said, what if I write for children? And then ding, that was the moment. <laughs> there was a moment, if you remember. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, uh, now we come to my theory. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. Okay, now you're gonna have to, I'll ask you about that. <laughs> you can ask me, but this show is about you, Lydia. Uh, so when you started writing for children, what, what age did you have in mind? I, I really wrote for the younger, the younger children because I connect to younger children more than I connect to teenagers, let's say. Although mine's going to be a teenager soon, so I, I better learn how to connect with teenagers soon. But uh, I, I, I'll, I'll make it. I'll make it easy for you. There's no way to connect with them. <laughs> you, right. <laughs> you, you lose the video connection like for a couple of years, and then it yeah. comes back. Yeah. Good. Good times are coming. There's a couple of lost years with the teenagers. Um, yeah. We can talk about that. Um, yeah, that's a whole other. What, what age kids speak to you? So uh, I, I, I would say five uh, or four, four to seven was really who I wrote for when I first started writing Kid Lit. I loved the, the openness of their minds. I love the innocence. That's what I connected to mostly was the innocence of a child at that age and how open their minds were and how deep their imagination was because children have so much imagination. It's incredible and they inspire me. So I really connected with and wrote for that age bracket. Okay, so my theory is very simply that those of us who write for five-year-olds, raise their hand, um, are their, their pain, their angst, is that of the five-year-old self. Oh, wow. So I know that I write for my own five, for the five-year-old inside me. Right. He helps me write. So I don't know whether this works for you also. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I had a revelation just the other day, and it's going to sound so simplistic, but it was a really aha moment for me of realizing why I like to write for children. Because I still have that sense of wonder and innocence in me, and it's been something I've been battling my whole life just trying to get rid of it, grow up, you, you need to be an adult. And I am, and, I, and I'm a responsible person. I, I am an adult with, a, with my head screwed on really well. But I, there's another part of me that's really sees life through the lens of a child. You know what I mean? Of wonder and innocence. Yeah, but I, so my argument would be that if you write for the five-year-old children, then maybe the Lydia inside you is that five-year-old child who had trouble fitting in. Oh, wow. I, I so totally relate to that. You know, when my first book came out, I, I was embarrassed. Oh, really? Yes, I had like at my, at my launch, I invited a very few people, nobody from the university. Um, so, 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 okay, so, so go on. Keep going, you're doing great. Where, where was I? <laughs> I, I Wherever, it's good. Start well, somewhere. I, uh, I started writing for children and at that time, I didn't know about SCBWI. And I really wish someone had told me about this because I did everything backwards. And when I look back, I'm like, wow, what, what was this path I chose? I, I, I did all the research that I could have gotten handed to me by SCBWI, like all the little but Most of our people don't know. So SCBWI That's it. is? It's an organization that uh, specializes in literature for children. 
And there's a host of resources that are given to you when you become a member, which by the way, it's not expensive. There's a whole host of resources. The first thing you get is the book that catalogs all the different publishers, agents. Uh, there's a bunch of webinars at your disposal. A lot of them are free. Some of them are not you know, costly at all, but you also network with a lot of other people in the industry, which is I think one of the most important things. So like I said, I did everything backwards. I remember one day I said, Lydia, you got you to get into this. You got to get a book published. So what did I do? I went to my daughter's bookcase. I took out every book. I opened it up and I wrote down the name of the publisher and I made myself a list of publishers. And of course, I didn't have to do that. That took me weeks to do, but that's just what I did. <laughs> and uh, I started you know, writing and sending my work out. And then eventually I got an opportunity with a really small publisher in Barrie, Ontario. Uh, Gerbil Meets Mouse Publishing, and that was my first book. Gerbil Meets Mouse Publishing. Yes, really small, independent, out of Barrie, Ontario. And they only write about gerbils. <laughs> well, you know, it's a kind of a gerbilization, right? What can it I was, uh, the, the publisher was a, an animal freak, so she had gerbils and dogs and birds and all kinds, so she was an animal lover. Well, and okay, so... <laughs> people in our audience do not know where Barrie, Ontario is. I don't know where Barry Ontario is. <laughs> I actually have no idea. <laughs> it's an hour north of Toronto in nowhere. Okay, right. It's it's kind of a a really small place, but I know that it's near really big places. So that's the They published your first book, which was about gerbils. It was about gerbils, about a gerbil who didn't want to go to bed. So it was about a five-year-old gerbil. <laughs> and he didn't want to go to bed, and it was with his father. And the whole book is all the shenanigans he pulls in order to avoid going to bed. And his father the whole time is getting extremely frustrated, progressively more frustrated because his child won't sleep. And then in the end, of course, he finally falls asleep. <laughs> that, that's incredible. And, and uh, how did the book uh, sell? How did it do? Well, you know, it, it was a small publisher. I didn't get an advance, fine. I got some royalties. I'm not gonna lie, my checks were meager. But it wasn't about the money at that point. It was about getting my foot in the door and saying, hey, yeah. I published a book. No, you know? you're, one, you're, you're already in this, at this stage, you're one of five or 10,000 people. Well, you know what I mean? Uh, and, no, and, and, and you did it your way without going through the regular routes. Yeah, I didn't do anything the normal way. In fact, her, the way I got that, uh, I didn't even query her. I saw an ad, I don't know, in this writing forum about looking for writers and I applied and I wrote a sample and she liked it and then I wrote more and she liked it and then I finally wrote the book but I never actually queried her. I didn't even know what querying meant. This is embarrassing but I didn't know anything about the industry. It's not All of that knowledge came later. It's not embarrassing to me here. <laughs> I'm going to be 69 in a few days. Oh wow, I, you don't look it at all. Thank you and I heard about SCPWI about five years ago. There you go. So I was doing the wrong things. I still may be but I, at least 40 years I was doing the wrong things uh, but I didn't find my gerbil I didn't find the gerbil <laughs> within me and you did so this is very important uh, did you have the and uh, did they say to you write us a story about a gerbil then you had the idea or you wrote a story about a gerbil and then you look for a public no I, I would have never in my wildest dreams written a book about a gerbil not that there's anything wrong with it it's just not an animal that I would have thought of uh, I met the publisher and she, she showed me, you know, the character developments that had been done. She already had characters that were set in stone. And then mm -hmm. she said, can you formulate a story from those characters? And so then I created the plot. And that's a lot of fun because I do a lot of work for hire. So I'm used to being given, uh, you know, certain directives and criteria and to have to work within those specs. So I'm pretty good at that. Now you're great at that. Like most of us are lousy at that. Well, it, with no, if, practice, if you'll get that. Says to me, if somebody says to me, write a story about a camel, <laughs> it won't be a good story. And I guess there's people like you, and, and this also has to do with writing nonfiction that we're going to get oh. to in a moment. Right. If you say, oh, okay, you want a gerbil? I'll give you a gerbil. You know, well, like the, the gerbil who loved chocolate pudding. This is, this is something that you, this is a gift that you have. Listen, to be honest, at that point in my career, I was so hungry for a contract that I would have written about anything. If you had said, write about jumping spiders and I hate spiders, I would have said, okay. <laughs> I'm writing now about a spider, but I'm not going to send it to you for... Uh, yeah, no, don't. I'm not going to critique that one. 
I know you hate spiders. I saw it on your website. And, and it's also in my, my last fiction uh, book that one of the characters hated spiders. So it always finds its way in. And this, somehow the spiders always find their way to me too. I don't know. They sense my, my hatred of them and they flock to me. <laughs> You know what? I am going to send you that. You're going to write a great critique for my uh, story. Oh, I'll, I'll push through. I'll push through because they're, they're really beautiful creatures. And I'm an animal lover. I'm a vegetarian 30 years. So why do I hate spiders? They're just creepy. <laughs> and, and spiders are not vegetarian. That's true. <laughs> so, okay. So, so you had your first gerbil book. This is incredible. It was you're, a great moment. You broke in with a small, you know, you sound like Robert Munch. Well, um, I don't know if I'd compare myself to him just yet, but I'm hopefully no, but headed in that direction. He also broke in with a small Canadian publisher. It yeah. became a very big Canadian publisher because of him. Well, that's it. I mean, everyone starts somewhere. And so that was my point of departure for, for, for my career. And it was, uh, I thank my lucky stars that I worked with this publisher because she gave me a lot of opportunities. So like I said, it wasn't about the advance. It wasn't about the money. It was about the opportunity that I got from that experience. Who wants money? I'm thinking of buying a publishing house so I can have <laughs> Well, you know, I'm not going to lie because we want to be realistic about the writing craft. We all say, oh, it's art. We don't care about money, but we do care about money. Do I want to be a millionaire? No, that has never been my aspiration. However, I want to make my life work feasibly, you know, with, with my wages. So it needs to make sense. So we do need to make money and be so paid for what, what we do. Lydia, so this is what you do full time. You don't teach. You don't... Uh sell jewelry you write so my career is separated into three different domains the first domain is writing workshops that i give through culture in the schools here in quebec so the quebec government mandates artists of different disciplines be it dance uh you know hip-hop music writing so i got accepted into the writing program and i work with a lot of different schools so i have to say that's my bread and butter so that's where i make most of my money and then the second domain is uh, work for hire. So I work with a lot of educational publishers in the educational market. They tell me, Lydia, write a book about dolphins with this Lexile. Lexile is the comprehension level, this many words, this many sidebars, everything's like very detailed. And I just produce the book. You don't get any royalties. It's a flat fee, but it's pretty good money. It's not great money. It's pretty good money, but it, you know, it, it pays, for, uh, pays for the food on the table. And then the third domain, which I'm making the least money at, is my own books. So that really is the toughest one to build up. And I think it takes years. I really do. Well, so I don't understand your own books. Uh, my own way. books, meaning they're my own ideas. And I'm querying uh, agents or publishers with those ideas. And I'm publishing my own books that have nothing to do with what another person would, would hire me to do. So but this, is the, this is the most fun. Yeah. And for sure, it's the most difficult. Oh, yeah. There's no, there's no way that I would make a life for myself with just my books. I'm getting peanuts. Like, I haven't made that big break yet, but I feel like I'm getting really close. I just signed with a very big agent. Yeah. So this, uh, is the time, this is the time to mention, if you want to, because you have a brand new amazing agent. And just to say, I've been through two agents already at this point when I signed with her. So I've been through the ringer. I, it has been years of hundreds of rejection letters, times where, and I'll be honest with you, where I wanted to give up on my craft. I was like, that's it. This is not the craft for me. This is too difficult. There's no point in continuing. And after uh, I parted ways with my second agent, I did kind of give up for six months, not give up. I didn't want anything to do with agents. I said to myself, no more querying, enough with the agents, I'm done. And I focused on my writing. And then slowly I began to think, well, to get to the next place in my career, you really do need that agent because they can open doors that you can never open. Lots of publishers don't accept unsolicited manuscripts. So you really need this agent fighting for you. I don't know the legal jargon either. So you need that agent to, to fight for you and to understand how contracts work. So I had been starting, I had started a conversation with Miranda Paul from Aaron Murphy Literary Agency last year. So literally a year ago, we started a conversation. She loved one of my books, asked for some edits. And you know what? Those edits did not happen overnight. It took me four months to, to produce those edits because I knew, basically she told me, you have one more chance with me. She didn't say it in those words, but I knew that this, if I, if I didn't impress her with these edits, 
she'll, she'll pass. So I was very close to the edge. And it took me a while to figure out, and this is a really big point, how to write a nonfiction book that's more trade-like than educational-like. Because I was born into the educational world, right? So she said, I like your book, but it really skews educational. We need to make it more trade and commercial. And so that's a huge edit right there. It's not like you can do that in two weeks. You have to figure out what makes something commercial. So it took four months, mm -hmm. sent her back the edits. She loved them. But then guess what happened like four days before? The pandemic. <laughs> so it was very bad timing. She said, you know, I love your edits. This is a great book. It will sell. But I can't take on clients right now. The pandemic just hit. My kids are home. I don't know what's going on with the publishing world. So it was all hell broke loose since March. And she said, come back to me in the fall, which I did. And then finally, I signed with her in September. Incredible. It was a um, long time coming. <laughs> how, how important is it to actually meet these agents? So well, they, they know who, who you are when you ferry them. Because they get thousands of queries a year, and they only take like less than five. So. Well, that's it. I mean, the thing with the Aaron Murphy Literary Agency is that they're not open to submissions. So you can't send to them unless you're referred by someone in the industry. Now, get this. My second agent... We parted ways, but we were still friendly. We are on very amicable terms. And she emailed me out of the blue and said, Lydia, you're a great writer. It didn't work out between us. What can I do to help you? And I said, wow. well, do you know, I sent her a list of 20 agents. I love these agents. Do you know any of them? And she wow. said, yeah, there's three that I know and I can refer you. Didn't work out with two of them. And she said, I know Miranda, so I can refer you. And that's how I got my foot in the door because otherwise you can't, you can't just query Miranda. That, that's incredible. And, and uh, other than I've been dying to meet you, ah. there's, a, there's a really good reason. Uh, you know, and I'll tell you something else. Um, I realized now that it, in order to make any headway in this industry, you have to know the agents. You have to attend the conference and there's no conference. And I was supposed to go to Ottawa for the first time in almost 50 years. Oh, wow. To the SCBWI in Ottawa in April, and it was canceled. Oh, yeah. I was going to meet Harold Underdown, who I'm working with now. Oh, Harold. He's, see, if you know Harold, you know a million people. He knows everybody. <laughs> okay. Now I'm working with Harold, so it's a different relationship. But that's still, I mean, I think if you work with someone, I've worked with, with some nonfiction writers who critiqued my work, and that's still it's still a, a really important relationship to have because yeah. you can have your mentors, you know? Oh, so Harold is my mentor. I love him. Um, and uh, before that, Mike Malbro, these are hugely important to the people in my writing life. And I think um, it's great. And at least, you know, I may never find an agent, but my writing is getting better. But so no. but, but this show is about you, dear. So we have a good reason to celebrate. Which yes. Is you have two books coming out, which you call nonfiction. They are nonfiction. They're, um, one of them is called Haunted Houses and the other is Haunted Hotels with Black Rabbit Books. Now this is an educational publisher, but I had so much fun with these topics. Look, I'm, I don't like horror. I never watched Stephen King movies or read his books. I don't like horror. But when it came time to writing about ghosts, because these are not fantastical stories, these were real documented cases of experiences of paranormal nature. We can't draw a conclusion at the end of the book. We can't say ghosts are real or ghosts are not real. We don't know. And that's part of the beauty. It lets the reader make up their own mind. Here are the facts. Now you decide what you're going to do with them. It's incredible because um, I'm a scientist as well as a writer. And when you tell me that you've written nonfiction about haunted houses and haunted hotels, I say, wow, Lydia, that's remarkable. It, it's, it's a remarkable thing just to see so many similar stories coming from the same location by different people who never met and people from around the world. So how could these people all have similar experiences in the same place? Example, some haunted hotels, uh, there was the Stanley Hotel where actually Stephen King stayed at and Stephen King himself and his wife observed paranormal, paranormal phenomena. And then that's what inspired him to write the book, The Shining, true story. So this hotel had certain rooms, only certain rooms were haunted. And people of various countries from around the world would come to this hotel and all have the same experience in the same room. So how do you explain that? First of all, where is this hotel? So I'll know where not to visit. <laughs> I think it's in Colorado. And I, I remember writing that it was built on a bed of crystals 
and some you know scientists were trying to decipher well does that have anything to do with it do crystals have some kind of uh, maybe not scientists but paranormal researchers because i think a lot of scientists would dismiss this as hoax because there were a lot of hoaxes to be honest as i was writing the book i, I found a lot of stories that became news headlines that were hoaxes so unfortunately the world is riddled with with these stories but maybe some of them are real it makes you wonder Okay, so look, uh, you talked about philosophy. I'm, I'm a student of one of the best students of Karl Popper. Oh, yeah. Joseph Agassi. And I don't believe, I want to say, I don't believe shit. But this, you know, I, this is an interview. So I, I really don't believe anything. Right, and okay. So do, do, you, do you believe? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I am a believer in many things that I cannot explain, that science cannot explain. So I... <laughs> Science can't, here. science can't explain shit. But, but, but I think that maybe eventually science will be able to explain it, or you know what I mean? Or, or maybe we just need to understand it in a different way. I believe, I do believe in ghosts. I mean, I, I think a lot of stories out there are hoaxes, but I think maybe yeah. some of them are real. I believe in spirit. I, I, I'm spiritual. Uh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. So I have the beliefs that go against science, but, but Science and, and the world of art and the world of spirituality do connect as well. So they're not as... Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I'm a scientist who doesn't believe in science. So it's okay. <laughs> no, everything's okay. You can, you can believe in haunted houses. It's just funny to call it nonfiction. That's the only point. Well, yeah, so it's... Really, yeah, so I, I, congratulations on these books. Thank you. Um, I, I will, of course, buy them and send them to my family in Canada, Thank as I you. love to do with, with your books. Um, but um, the question is, you've published 40 books now, which is rather incredible. Thank and um, what's your favorite? Well, I mean, you know, I, I have a favorite, but it hasn't been published yet. <laughs> this is, I have to explain the experience of writing this book. I've never experienced this in my life. It was a lot of times writing for me is difficult and painful. <laughs> I, I know that, you know, I was listening to Judy Bloom at the last SCBWI conference and she was saying she doesn't understand that experience. Writing is a joyous thing for her and she, she loves it and it things, you know, she has to work hard at it, but it kind of falls into place. That's not my experience. <laughs> writing, maybe writing the first draft isn't so bad, but editing definitely I find very difficult. I'm knocking my head on the wall. Uh, things don't work out. You have to shelf some books, throw them away. They're just not working. So I find it difficult. Now with this book, I can't talk about it yet because it's on submission with Miranda. It was the first time where I felt like things were flowing. And it's not to say that it wasn't a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of research. Uh, it was a lot of going back and editing because a lot of the facts I first put in weren't right. There's a lot of misinformation on the web about this particular topic, but it just flowed. And then every, every scientist I would ask to interview said yes, and everything just fell into place. And it was fun. It was the first time that it was fun. And I hope I get that experience again. <laughs> it's a fiction, nonfiction, what is it? It's nonfiction. It's about the Mariana Trench, which is of course the, the deepest spot in the ocean and in the entire world. And it was the funnest, uh, most eye-opening, most interesting, fascinating, and also scary experience of my life because I don't like diving into, like would I ever scuba dive? No, I'm not the type. I'm, I'm scared of my own shadow when it comes to under, being underwater. I'm afraid of all these things, but yet I'm drawn to them. I want to know more about them. So even though I'm, I would be afraid to literally take that dive, I took that dive metaphorically through my research. And what's down there? What's, what's at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. I um, hope it happens again. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. I hope so. Sure it will. There's noise outside. I'm going to shut the window. Hold on a second. No worries. In the, in the meantime, ask yourself a question. Yes. Well, I think you were also asking me about favorite books. Um, there have been many books that I. I I can't say that there's been any book that I've written that I that I don't like, but there are some books where I read them now and I'm like, wow, I, I wish I could edit that now with the eye that I have today. You know, writing that I did, you know, five, six years ago. It's I'm not the same writer, 
So there, there's sometimes I cringe at my own words. I'm like, oh, I wish I could change that. But that's part of the path as well. And I'm sure in five years, I might be cringing at the things I'm writing now. We're hard on ourselves as writers. I think that can be a good thing. It can drive you forward. But you also don't want to exaggerate that because you do also need to believe in yourself. So because if you constantly negate yourself and you're, you're writing, then you, you're not, you're not going to move forward. So it's a delicate balance between critiquing yourself, being open to critique, which I love critique. And sometimes it hurts, it stings, but I love it because I want to know what you really think. If you don't like it, tell me why you don't like it. Why is it not working? But you also need to believe in yourself. It's so difficult. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, you know, I, I think even, you know, I talk to a lot of writers that I consider mentors and if you ask them, are you a great writer? They would probably say no and that they're still learning as well. So we're all in the same boat to a certain extent, or we have that complex where we, we feel like, well, yeah, okay, I've published 40 books, but I'm really not all that. Or, you know what I mean? I, I There's a lot more that I want to achieve. So that, I would ask you, what, what is your best book? What is the answer? Well, I mean, again, it's it, it's the book that hasn't been published yet, but I did like my last uh, fiction book, No Bears Allowed. Uh, it's it's just, it's not a loud book, it's a quiet book. Uh, and there's something to be said for quiet books that, that also cultivate empathy. It was about empathy and learning how to not judge people with preconceived notions. I have a soft spot in my heart for that book and I'm so glad that Blue Whale Press decided to publish it. Um, it, it, it was just one of those books that, that was from the heart. And when a book comes from the heart, it's magic because it's a part of you is on the pages. You know what I mean? So it's kind of special. You, you're, you're an artist. Why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, illustrate your own books? Uh, well, I, you know, drawing was, I did draw and paint when I was younger, but I just never pursued that. Uh, as I grew up, I told you, I studied science and then I studied literature. So I never got the opportunity to study that. If I had studied and spent years learning about those crafts, I might be a better drawer and, and illustrator. Uh, I'm not that great, but I'm great at collage. So I'm a great artist in certain respects, but I don't think you want me drawing stick men in your, in your books. <laughs> I don't think they'd work out too well, but. I, I, I you know, if, if it's you, I wouldn't mind so much. <laughs> well, maybe I could do an interesting collage. I'd be, every artist has their, their mediums that are, you know, come more easily. I, 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 will, I will let you collage any of my books. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, you know, I, I, I am an artist, so I, I would love to. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's one of those things that's interesting about me because I have the world of science, which by the way, was so amazing that I studied science and got those degrees because now I'm writing a lot about STEM topics. I have veered towards from fiction to nonfiction. That has been a big 180 that I've done in the last five years. And did I see that coming? No, I went, I set out wanting to write fiction. I was like, yes, fiction. I love magic. I love fantasy fiction. But somehow through reading and researching the industry, I just did a 180 and was drawn into the world of nonfiction. And that's pretty much where I'm rooted for the moment. I will still write fiction. I love fiction, but that just seems to be where I like to express myself. And because I have the science background, I can understand really heavy scientific concepts and I can distill them down to you know fun, engaging writing that a child can understand. Like what's gravity? Let's talk about it in fun ways or you know what I mean, photosynthesis. What is that? So you know what, what I want to say to everyone today is that nothing you do is lost. So whatever you study, whatever you write, even if it's not published, it is not lost. It will come back one day. You might not see it coming, but it will come back and be part of you. And I think that we have to honor every chapter in your life. Yeah, that's something very beautiful. Uh, Julie Hedlund said something similar in our discussion. So that's, uh, it's incredible that you're saying that. And um, Julie's, Julie's one, just if I can interject here, Julie's one of those people who's helping so many writers because we, we get this forum in 12 by 12 where we get to connect. It's not just about the great webinars. Those are amazing, but it's also about connection and encouragement. We all get those you know, horrible rejection letters, all of us, and even now I have an agent, I'm still getting rejections that sting. So we need to encourage each other. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm very encouraged. Uh, <laughs> interviewing you you're so remarkable um well i i try to be positive but you know that has come to bite me in the past because people uh, just 
have found me Lydia, overly positive. It's, <laughs> it's so hard being a writer. It's hard being a writer. It's it's like um, for me, I don't know about for you, but it's like it's like a, um, a chronic disease. You know, it's like it's an itch you have to keep scratching. That's what writing for kids is for me. Yeah. I don't know whether I love it or don't love it. I have to like something in my body itches if I don't if I don't scratch it. If I have yeah, an idea, that's, that's, paper. that's a great analogy because oh. what you're saying is that you feel compelled to write. Yes, um, but uh, this so before but this show is about you. So uh, we're getting towards the end. Okay, and we're going to talk about music now uh, because I remembered when I got up that uh, the poet was Irving Layton. Yes, Irving Layton was one of my favorite. Leonard Cohen's man, yeah, mentor and, 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 um, and you grew up in Montreal and you live in Montreal and Montreal is the home of all of these wonderful poets. Uh, so usually I ask my guests what their favorite Beatles song is. But well, I wonder whether I could, whether I could ask you uh, what your favorite Leonard Cohen song is. Oh, whether wow. That might be more appropriate. I'll answer both. My favorite Beatles song is Come Together and I Want to Hold Your Hand. Those two songs just like, I love those songs. Okay. And Leonard Cohen, I mean, my God, I think Suzanne, Suzanne would be my favorite song. I mean, he was, what an amazing artist, right? And I'm so sad that he's no longer here, but so happy that we have his work with us forever because I've you know read all of his books of poetry, but also his novels. Uh, and also what a tremendous singer. And, you know, like I was saying before, I went to school with Margaret Atwood's daughter and she would literally tell me stories about how she's just at home chilling, having tea with her mom and Leonard Cohen or Irving Layton would pop by and have dinner. It's like, what are these stories? I was enamored with these stories. <laughs> where is Can you Margaret? imagine? Where is, where is this lady? Well, I lost track of her. I mean, I was in my university days and um, I let's, remember- Let's find her, let's find her. I want to get to her. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm sure if you uh, looked her up on Google, you could find her. Okay, so you're going to send me, and, and you, you'll send me her name. Yeah. And I'll do the rest of the work, um, because maybe her, I'm, I'm sure Atwood is one of her names, but um, you'll send it to me. And um, Come Together is such a different song, you know, from Abbey Road, and I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is a very innocent song at the beginning of their career. Which yeah. One, which one would you like to sing? What's that? Usually on the show, my guests sing a song, so you can. Oh sing. no! Oh and no! I <laughs> did not hand. know about this. Or Suzanne. Suzanne is very easy to sing. Oh, I I don't know the words out by heart to that I'll, one, but I'll help you. Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. <laughs> You're on your own on that one. Okay, let's try come together. Come together, all right now, over me. Okay, I'm a terrible singer. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> and, and that's more than most people give. I, I'm terrible at singing, but the, the reason I love that song uh, is because I'm kind of a, a hippie, a hippie at heart. I really believe in unity and harmony. And that's one of the things that, that makes me naive, I guess, because, you know, look at the world. Although last night was great. We had a great night last night. So we have yeah, some hope. We, yes, we won't go there, but yes. But let's not go there. <laughs> but the point is, uh, I believe in unity. And that song is beautiful because it's about coming together. As And they spoke a lot about that and, you know, just unity instead of being separate and, and hating each other and having conflict. And that, that's so, another wonderful reason for writing for kids. Yeah, absolutely. It's like legacy with a capital L. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. And I think that's a funny thing that I only understood that the other day about why I connect well, so well and why I'm writing for kids. But it's just something that came from my soul, from my heart. So I was just doing it without thinking about it. But now, you know, as you get older and, and the years go by, you, you become more conscious of your craft, why you do things, how you do things, and so on and so forth. So I'm understanding myself more. So uh, listen, um, I want to remind you, you have a website where you help writers. And you want to put that under in the links underneath the uh, interview. You have two haunted books coming out 
nonfiction. We can talk more about that. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Mel, two books of nonfiction, Haunted Houses and Haunted Hotels. Nonfiction, Mel. That's the real it. thing. I love it. I love you for that. Uh, put the links where you can uh, pre-order the books. And anything else, it's been a real joy to, uh, to interview you, to get to meet you a bit. Is there anything I should have asked you that I forgot? No, I think we, we got everything. I mean, I'll put my website in the links and I do offer, uh, if you subscribe to my newsletter, I do offer free games and riddles and workshop, uh, workshop kind of uh, stories for kids from three to 12. So every month I really make an effort to write kids for kids for free and I send them out. So if you have kids or want to send them to people in the community, feel free to subscribe. Wow, my kids are grandkids, you know, but- um... <laughs> Or grandkids, that's it. Yes, and, and who knows, we might do a, a collage uh, story together. Well, yeah, I mean, now that you're talking about it, I'm getting a little bit more inspired to to explore that medium because it's been a while since I've really, because I've spent so much time writing that I kind of forgot about the, the more visual arts aspect, so. Yes, but let, let's explore that medium. But when you call it a medium, Maria, I get worried. <laughs> That's it. You're like, what is she talking about? <laughs> medium, you know, medium, uh-oh. Here we are that again one. with the ghost. That's a whole um, other call. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so we'll take this offline someday. Uh, okay, Lydia Lokidis, it's remarkable having you on You've Got Mel. Uh, and all I can say is keep doing the wonderful work that you are and uh, keep the strength because uh, you're reaching out wonderfully to so many people. Thank you so much for having me and, and for, for also doing so much work to, you know, to have people on your show and to talk about, uh, you know, issues in the community and just keep building that community. So thank you. It's a, for me, it's a, it's a huge honor. So Aww. thank you so much, dear. And, Thank uh, you so we'll much. And we'll, we'll meet one of these days. Absolutely. Come on down to Canada, eh? <laughs> Maybe uh, at Montreal, eh? That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, my dear. Take Bye, care. everybody. Bye. Kaleme, nasekala. Kala, exactly. <laughs>